good morning. Good to see you this beautiful Sunday morning. Glad you could be here with us. Let's turn to 220 in our hymn books. 220, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Let's stand together. He lives. Easter Sunday, 220. 220, all three verses. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy, I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me. to see later on, I, I hope, uh, at least in God's word, it's all about that fact that he lives. Without Christ being alive, then we have no hope, but he is, and we praise God for that. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you we can be here this morning. We pray that you would help us as we gather around your word, as we pray and sing together. We pray that you would be pleased. We pray that you would help us to receive the things that we need today so that we can take them throughout the week and be a testimony for you. Thank you for your blessings, your goodness to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. Turn to 404 if you would please, 404 on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. We'll sing all four verses, hymn number 404. The solid rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I do not trust the sweetest ray.
by way of announcements this week. Please be in your place, 7 o'clock Wednesday night. We will, well, we'll see how far we get with the sermon today. If we don't finish it up, we'll continue it Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. So please be in your place, and we'll look forward to seeing you again for the midweek prayer meeting. And please do be in prayer for school as it continues on this week, and the kids are trying to finish up subjects and what have you, and discipleship as we have those lessons to teach to folks this week, please do be praying for that. And then keep in mind the Bible study books, John, Genesis, and 1 Samuel back on the table there. And they don't cost you a thing. If you will use them, please feel free to take whatever you will. If you know someone who'd like them, please feel free to take and pass it on. And we'll replenish as we run out. So please feel free to use those as you see fit. Any other announcements, dear? Okay. Well, Andrea is going to sing for you today. If you're wondering what this stand is all about, it is for her to be able to read her music. And so she's going to come and sing out of hymn number one in your hymn book, if you'd like to follow her along or follow along with her, hymn number one, which is Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Andrea, and forgive me while we do a little bit of transitioning here. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15, if you would, please. 1 Corinthians 15, as we're turning there, I'm going to get situated again. Uh, 
uh, the wonder of technology. Who would think this little microphone would do better than any other microphone that we have in the building? But it does, and so we work with it. So thank you for your patience there. 1 Corinthians 15 is where we'll be this morning. I don't usually shift away from what we're studying through. As you know, we're studying through the fruit of the flesh and the spirit in Galatians 5. But this week, it just so happened that we fell on this in 1 Corinthians 15, and I trust it'll be a help and a blessing as this passage talks all about the gospel and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it presents a very logical presentation of why what you and I believe is not in vain, <laughs> is not foolishness, uh, is not a waste of time. I mean, again, the world, as we've said before, the world thinks that what we're doing today is useless, is foolishness. You're, you're better off going fishing, better off spending time with family or going out to those Easter brunches or having those Easter egg hunts or whatever else the world can think of to do. I, I mean, baseball season just started this past week. You're better off going to a ball game today than being in church is what the world thinks. But I trust that the reason that you are here today is because you believe Jesus is alive. And there, there's nothing better than that. You see the world falling apart out there, don't we? And it is. The Bible promises such. Evil men seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived as the last days come. We look at this and, and sadly there are many believers that fall into the trap of running around like chickens with their heads cut off just like the world is and saying, oh no, it's terrible, what do we do? The closer we get to Christ, the more we read, study, and apply his word, the less we do that because we understand God is in control. He is in control. Not the news media, not the, not the world powers, not the devil. He is in control. What is going on is what he allows, and it's for his purposes and for his glory, according to his plan. You say, well, I don't understand everything that's going on. I can't understand. It's not, for meant, it's not meant for us to understand. It's meant for us to trust and believe and walk with Christ for ourselves. So look at 1 Corinthians 15, if you would please, in verse number 12, where the Bible says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. We're going to focus on and pull our title from that verse 14. If Christ be not risen. And we're going to look at the context of this entire chapter and consider some very logical things about what Paul is saying here, if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. And then we're going to look at the hopeful part, the wonderful part, the truth that Christ is risen and based upon what we've already looked at, what that means to us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time that we have and we thank you that Christ is risen from the dead. And we do pray that if there be any that are not saved today, that you will work on their hearts and they would trust in Christ because he is alive. Because your word is true, your promises are good. And this book is the only thing that we can trust in this wicked world. Speak to hearts, work in lives today. Help us to come forth from this meeting loving you more. We'll thank you for it. Please fill us with your spirit now. Give us understanding and help me to say everything that I ought to say and nothing that I shouldn't. 
We'll thank you and give you the glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If Christ be not risen, and so we have just two points for this. One is if Christ is not risen from the dead, and strictly, quickly under that, number one, the gospel is not good news. If Christ is not risen from the dead, the gospel is not good news. And we see that in verse number one through 11. The word gospel literally means good news or good tidings. But if Christ is not risen, the gospel is not good news. From this passage, we glean the definition of the gospel. People say, well, I'm preaching the gospel. I love, I love to give the gospel. But if you ask people, what is the gospel? They don't really know. And from this passage, we can say, if someone were to ask us, what is the gospel? We can say, this is the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for our sins. It says, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. How are we saved from sin? We are saved by the gospel, by believing its message. It says, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas and of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet or suitable to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. So if Christ is not risen, the gospel is not good news. The gospel focuses on the person and work of Christ. It's all about Jesus, not about us. I came across people uh, this past week, the, the Church of Christ folks and those folks believe in what, uh, baptismal regeneration, which is you get baptized and it washes your sins away. And sadly, this gentleman literally said that you need to get baptized and wash your sins away. No, folks, baptismal waters don't wash anyone's sins away. As one preacher jokingly said, if baptismal waters wash someone's sins away, then you need to change the water out every time you baptize because otherwise the last person comes out worse than he went in because everyone's sins are floating in the water or what have you. No, baptism is a work. It's just something people do. It is a commanded ordinance. It is a profession of faith in Christ. It is obedience to Christ, but it does not save anyone. Salvation is all about Jesus. And what he did for us, because we could not do for ourselves. And so it focuses on the person and work of Christ. If Christ was not who the Bible says he was, then what he did for us was of no effect. In other words, if Christ was a sinner and he went to the cross, dying for the sins of mankind would be no different than if you or I went to the cross for one another. It would have no effect. Christ had to be who the Bible says he is for what he did to be made effective. And if Christ did not do what the Bible says he is, no matter who he is, it's pointless, right? Christ is God made flesh, but he didn't die for the sins of mankind. Well, we're still in our sins if that didn't happen. So the person and work of Christ have to be what the Bible says it is as we believe the Bible to be the very word of God. So who does very quickly, and this may take up much time, I don't know, but I'm not trying to be in a hurry. 
But John chapter 1, who does the Bible say that Christ is? You say, well, of course, I, I know who Jesus is. That's great. But the world does not generally know who Jesus is, or they have a skewed understanding of who Christ is. And so we're going to look at John chapter 1 and see five things about the person of Christ through this that you can supplement with other parts of Scripture. One is that he's the Word made flesh. He's the Word made flesh. Jesus Christ is God. John 10, 30, Jesus says, I and my Father are one, or one in the same. Jesus equals God. He is God. He is not like unto God. He is not the created Son of God, as some groups believe. He is God made flesh. And that's what the Bible says here. Before he was ever Jesus, he was the Word. Jesus is his earthy name, if you want to put it that way. But before he was Jesus, he was the Word. And John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Very clearly, he is the Word. And verse number 14 also complements that and says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Who is Jesus Christ? He is the Word made flesh. The Word made flesh. He's the one that came and lived a perfect life that we could not. He's the one that fulfilled the law of Moses that we could not fulfill. He's the one that did all the work for us that we could not do for ourselves. And if we tried, we would fail miserably, every one of us, because we are sinners, as the scriptures say. There is none righteous, no, not one. We don't like that in our flesh. We don't like being told that someone did something for us that we can't do for ourselves, but doesn't make it any less true. We don't like being told that we're sinners that have offended a righteous God, that have broken his law, that, that he demands judgment. We don't like that, but it doesn't make it any less true. That's why most people will refuse Christ because of pride. They want to do something themselves that they can't do. That they can't do. We have to accept that by faith. Philippians 2, 5 through 8 talks about Christ shedding his robe of glory and coming to earth for us. So who is the person of Christ? He is the word made flesh. And then we have he is the life that came to those that were dead. We're dead in trespasses and sins. We're dead spiritually. Even though we may be alive in the flesh, we're birthed spiritually stillborn, the scripture says. And so John 1 and verse number 3, it says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made, talking about Christ also being the creator, which we will get to. And it says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. In him was life, and the light was the light of men. Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And again, as humans, we don't like that. Our flesh doesn't like it. We don't like to be told this is the only way that works. But we know in reality, in life, that there, we accept that so many times. There is only one way that works for so many things. And if we try multiple ways of various things, it's not going to work. There's only one way to put gas in your car. You don't put it in the radiator cap. You don't put it in the antifreeze tank. You put it in the gas tank. Try anything else, your car's going to blow up or just not work. It's only one way to change oil in your car. It's not by draining the, the uh, antifreeze, right? It's by draining the oil, changing out the oil filter, all those good things. If we don't do that, then the oil will coagulate or dry up. Your engine will seize and you don't have a car anymore. We understand those things. We accept those things. But we don't like it when God says, you can't save yourself. 
Jesus has to save you. He, we don't like it when he says, you're dead spiritually. You are not my child. You are a child of the devil. You are a rebel against my authority. Here's my word. You need to accept it and believe it. We don't like that in our flesh because we are prideful. But nonetheless, the word states it very clearly. Ephesians 2 and 1 through 10, I'll let, that, let you read that for yourself. It says, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Going back to John 1, verse number 5, who is Jesus? Again, he is the light that came to the darkness. The light that came to the darkness. The light shineth in the darkness, it says, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, talking about John the Baptist, but was sent to bear witness of that light. What was John's job? It was to be the forerunner of Christ, to promote Christ, not himself. And you see him do a very good job of that in the scriptures, don't you? It says, that was the true light, in verse number nine, talking about Jesus, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He is the light, the light. If you're saved today, you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior. First John says that we walk in the light as he is in the light. And that's where our fellowship comes from, around the word of God. That's where friendship comes from with the saints, is our love for Christ and his word. It's not just because we, we have some commonalities. No, the commonality for Christ's church is Christ. We have much to talk about when we talk about Jesus. When we talk about what we learn as we do in Sunday school, we talk about what we learn from our Bible reading in the week. We talk about in discipleship what God's doing in our lives. We talk about other times. That's the great commonality that we have that we do not have with the world because you try to talk about Christ with the world by and large, they'll think we're crazy. <laughs> we talk about how good God is or, or what God's done in answering prayer, or what we learned from the word of God. The world doesn't want to hear it, do they? And as First John says, we walk in the light as he is in the light. John chapter 3, verse 16. You probably know John 3, 16 fairly well. Maybe not. But it does say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But it does not stop there. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. You try to give someone truth today, what do they generally say? Oh, don't judge me, right? When the fact is we judge all the time uh, the, the fact is people don't want to be told that they're wrong. <laughs> they don't want to be told the truth because it smacks against our pride. And that's what Jesus did. He, he didn't wrong any individual. He didn't stir up a riot, right? All he did was preach the truth and wicked men put him on the cross because they were envious of him. Now, some did believe and praise God for everyone that did. Just as in our day, praise God for all those that do believe. But the fact is, this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. People that love living in their sin want to just keep living in their sin. They don't want to be told that they're wrong. They hate the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. And what is reproof? It is correction, is it not? But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. You see, if you're saved, 
you love the light of God's word. First John talks about that also. We love God's word. We love God's people. It's the Holy Spirit within us that unites us one with another. That as we give the truth of God's word, we can't get enough of it. As we read through the word of God throughout the week, we delight in it because by it we are saved and by it we grow in Christ. If we don't have a love for the word of God, and we call ourselves saved, there's a problem. And a big one, isn't there? There's a problem. And so it is. He that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. You see, people that are saved don't mind the questioning. They don't mind being reproved. I'll sure it still smacks against our pride. But instead of getting all prideful, people following Christ, abiding in him, bearing the fruit of the Spirit, when I come up to Jimmy and say, Jimmy, let's help you with some things, he doesn't say, I don't need your help. How dare you say something to me? He says, oh, thank you. And so my, my, my wife had that on social media. I think there was a lady on a sewing thing that actually didn't get offended when someone corrected her. That's pretty rare, isn't it? But it, it's a good thing. People that love light, love light. And they want to follow light. And they might be off on some things. And I'll tell you, folks, I could, I could show you in my life where I've been off on things. I might yet be off on things now. But if we love God and his word, he will correct us and we will be corrected. And we'll say, thank you, Lord, for showing me your truth. Thank you for showing me where I was wrong. Thank you and help me to follow that which is right. Jesus is the light that came into the darkness. He's also the creator that came to the creation. In John chapter 1 again, verse number 10, he was in the world. Talking about the word made flesh. He was in the world and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. You say, I thought in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Yes, indeed, the Father had his part in creation, but also you read the book of Genesis, you find that the Spirit had his part in creation, and you find here that the Son had his part in creation. The Trinity is not three different gods, but three in one, Father, Son, and Spirit, all doing their agreed-upon jobs in the universe because God does all things decently and in order. There's no chaos. What chaos we see in the universe is either perceived chaos or because of sin on our part. It says the world was made by him. The world knew him not. We did not evolve. We were created. We were brought into existence, made in the image of God. The world didn't come about by chance. It came about because God made it. You think about the theory of evolution, which is just that theory that cannot be proven. You think about the theory of the Big Bang and all of that. You think about how scientists so-called today, I'm not going to go long on this, but scientists so-called today say these things happen because they don't want to give God credit. They want, for some reason, to believe that they're the product of chance instead of the product of purpose. How much better is it to say, God made me, God saved me, and God gives me this purpose in life, instead of how so many people are today, walking around on Signal Mountain and off saying, I have no purpose. I have no hope. I mean, do not people, do not, uh, people say that with COVID, people got more and more and more depressed. And this nation is more depressed than it's ever been. The suicide rate and things like that. And you say, why? The answer is because our country is an ungodly country. They are rejecting Christ. There is a survey, and you take all surveys with a grain of salt, but the survey says that for the first time in, I suppose, the history of our country, 
more than half of the people that live in our country don't go to any church of any sort. They a claim to know God, not the God of the Muslims, not the God of the Catholics, not, the, not any God. We're becoming more and more a godless nation. And if that's the case that is so, I mean, the true Bible-believing churches, you know, you think about compared to everything else that is done in the name of God, it's even so much smaller, isn't it? It's sad. How much better to believe, because the Bible says so, God has created us, he saved us, by his grace, and as such, he's given us a great purpose, a great purpose in his work through Christ and for his glory. We look at the fourth thing. Oh, sorry, we're still on the fourth thing. It says, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. It's talking about two things there. If you get into the original languages, he came unto his own things, which we are his things, his creation. Humanity is what he made. He owns us, whether we like it or not. And then the second thing talks about his people. His people, his own. I'm sorry, verse 11. The first, his own is his own things, and the second his own is his own people. The Jews received him not. We see in Colossians 1, verse 15 through 17, clearly again, it talks about Christ as the creator, the creator that came to the creation. Then fifth, the savior that came to those that needed to be saved. And who needs to be saved? Every single person that's born Every single person that's born has ever been born because we're born sinners. We choose to sin. I accepted Christ as my Savior when I was seven years old at church camp and missionaries came, preached the gospel, told me that Jesus Christ was the only Savior. I was a wicked sinner. And you say, well, seven years old, how much of a sinner can you be? I mean, I've seen some pretty bad seven-year-olds. I don't remember much from that time, but I know I, I lied to my parents and rebelled against my parents and did things that I shouldn't have. And God smote my heart that day. It wasn't because of some sales pitch that the missionaries put forth because they didn't put forth one. It wasn't that I went forward at some emotionalistic altar call because they didn't offer one. It was God through the gospel smote my heart and I knew I was a sinner and I deserved to go to hell to pay for my sin. And the only way out was Jesus. That night in my bunk bed, I was scared to death about hell and not because the missionaries were trying to make us scared to death. There was no dramatic production or anything. There was just the Bible and I was scared and I knew I needed Jesus. And the best I knew how, I welcomed him accepted him, whatever you want to say about it, I believed in what the Bible says about his person and his work. Trusting in him as my savior. That's what he came to do, to seek and to save that which was lost. And verse number 12 says, but as many as received him, back in John 1, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. You say, how do we become the sons of God? How, how are we saved? It's all through Christ. Even to them that believe on his name. People say, well, I prayed a prayer, I believe. If you believe, you will continue with him. If you're really putting your faith and trust in Christ as your savior, you will continue with him. You will learn about him and study at his feet. You will do the things that he commands us to do because he has transformed, as scripture promises, he has transformed our hearts and given us a desire to do so. Will we ever 
uh, always be perfect at it? No. But we'll have the desire, we'll have the want to. Too many people slap the name Christian upon themselves, but there's no fruit out of their lives except that of the flesh. You ask them, did you read your Bible at all this week? No, I didn't do that. What prayers has God answered for you recently? Oh, I don't, I don't know. What has God spoken to you about through the, through the church messages? Oh, I don't know. There's no fruit. So there's no life. But people have been deceived into believing because they prayed a prayer, for instance, or they did some other thing that they're saved. No, folks, belief is proven, James says, through our works. We don't work to be saved, but we work because we are saved. Why should you study your Bible? Because it's the only book we have that tells us about Christ and the Christian walk. Why should we be in church? Because it's the only place we can congregate with believers and be encouraged together and pray together and sing together and Study God's word together. Why should we do all these other things? Because God gives us a desire for these things. And the more that we follow Christ, the more we'll have that desire. Christ came to save those that needed to be saved. So that's the person of Christ. Secondly, we work at, look briefly, and we could study Christology all day long, but we look at four Four things about the work of Christ. What did he do? What did he do? I mean, Jesus is God made flesh. He, he humbled himself to come to be among us. What did he do for us that makes such a difference that we could not do for ourselves? Well, one, he fulfilled the Mosaic law in righteousness. Matthew 5.17 says that he came to fulfill the law. You want to condense the law, the 613 commands of the law, down to 10. We call them the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any graven images, and on and on. And that's enough for us to understand that we are not righteous if we were to go through that. People say, well, I'm not such a bad person. Well, we go through the law. The law condemns us. That's what Romans chapter 7 says. And we have to ask ourselves, hey, have I ever... Uh, have I ever killed somebody? Thou shalt not kill, right? It's like, oh, people say, oh, I've never killed anybody. Okay, well, great. Have you ever lied? <laughs> Thou shalt not bear false witness. <laughs> have you ever lied? All of us have lied. Have you ever stolen anything, taken something that wasn't yours? Certainly we have. Maybe nothing major, but certainly something minor. You ever dishonored your parents? Oh, no, I've always been a perfect child. Let's talk to the parents about that. You can talk to mine and they can tell you all the good stories about me when I was my kid's age and younger. Or Sarah's parents and all the stories of when she was little and all the various things we talk about in our family that the church doesn't need to know about. We've all dishonored our parents. None of us are perfect. And we go on through. Have any of us coveted something? Oh, certainly. Our nation's full of covetousness, full of greed, a desire to have and have and have. And just with those things, we, we look through and we understand we are not righteous because God says so. So what did Jesus do? He lived in righteousness. He fulfilled the Mosaic law. He never sinned once. And that's what 2 Corinthians 5.21 says. He was... In Hebrews 4, 14 through 15, he was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. But not only that, we understand secondly that he provided redemption through his blood. You see, back in Genesis 3, mankind rebelled against God. Sin came into our kind and from Adam and Eve, we are sinners. And we could say God lost us. 
because we rebelled against him. There was a separation there between perfection and imperfection, righteousness and unrighteousness. Jesus is the bridge that brings us back to God. Jesus is the one that paid the price for our sin through his blood. I mean, we can either try to pay for our sin in hell, in unquenchable fire, or we can accept the payment that Jesus made for us. And how much better for the latter, right? <laughs> Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says, For all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ, excuse me, Christ Jesus. He provided redemption. Redemption means to buy back. On the cross, Jesus redeemed the whole world. He bought us back with his blood. He died for every person. You say, well, what about the sins I haven't done yet? Well, think about this. 2,000 years ago, you and I didn't exist. We hadn't yet sinned. Yet in the mind of an omniscient God, he knew all about us. And he died even for that sin. There's no sin that Christ did not pay for. You say, does that mean the whole world is saved then? No, by no means. Just because... Provision is made doesn't mean people will accept it. The work's already done, though, but it does not mean people will accept it, and they don't. They pridefully stand in front of Christ, if you will, and say, I refuse to trust in you. I would rather trust in my baptism, trust in my prayer, trust in my church membership, trust in my goodness, Trust in me, 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 instead of trusting in Christ. That's our pride, again. Colossians 1, 12 through 14, also talks about being redeemed through the blood of Christ. And so many other passages, Hebrews chapter 9 and 10, two great chapters talking about Christ being better than those sacrifices of the law, how all those sacrifices pointed to Jesus and he being our great high priest entered once with his blood and no more sacrifices need to be made because his was enough. His was enough. All those bulls and goats and doves that died in the Old Testament, all of them was a reminder to the Jews Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. Your work is not good enough. You need to be saved. Romans chapter 3 and verse 25, we see that Christ also satisfied God's justice through his blood. You see, as rebels, we have to pay for our rebellion. If my kids sin against me and my wife, it's our job to correct them, not say, oh, look how cute their sin is. No, it's to correct them so that they go on the path of righteousness. And God, his justice demands judgment upon sin because we've offended his law. You say, well, what, what does God have the right to make a law and expect us to follow it? Well, he's the creator. <laughs> he's the one that made us. And so he says, as the creator, I get to make the laws and he does but it's prideful man as a tiny little bug, as an infinitesimal speck shouting at the creator, you can't tell me what to do, and God laughs. Psalm 2 talks about that. He laughs in derision. He knows who's in control. He knows who he is. And so his justice demands that we pay for our sin. Romans 3 and verse 25 says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. That means a satisfaction. Through faith in what? In your prayer, in your baptism, in your church membership? No, in his blood. That he shed on the cross and willingly allowed to declare his righteousness for the remission or the putting away of sins that are passed through the forbearance, which is the patience of God. Satisfying God's justice. 
That's why the resurrection is so important, folks. Because Jesus walked around earth saying, hey, I'm going to go to the cross and die for your sins. I'm going to rise from the dead three days later. I'm going to give you eternal life if all you do is believe on me. Just read through the gospel records. That's all it talks about. Cross work is important. Just as important as the resurrection. Because the resurrection proves that all of what Jesus preached is true. There are many dead prophets still in their tombs today, aren't there? Only one risen Savior, and that is Christ. Jesus said, I'm going to die for your sins. And the Bible says he became sin for us who knew no sin. And if Christ was a sinner that deserved to die and stay in that tomb, God would have left him dead. If Christ was not God made flesh and he went around proclaiming that he was, stating God was his father, and that's why the Jews wanted to kill him, the scripture says. If God was willing to let a false prophet stay in the tomb, he would have stayed in the tomb. If Christ is not a false prophet, he is true. And thus he has risen from the dead, proving that he paid our sin debt, proving that God is satisfied with his work on the cross. 1 John 2 and verse number 1 and 2, which we will read, speaks of similar things. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's our defense attorney. Not everyone's defense attorney, but ours that are saved because we're made to be righteous in God's sight. And it says, and he is the propitiation, the satisfaction for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Who did Jesus die for? Every single person that's ever lived. Every single person that's ever lived. So he didn't just satisfy God's justice, but he also secured justification and reconciliation. Justification means to be made righteous. Now, you and I both know, if you're saved, you know you're still a sinner. We, we mess up every day. We still have that sin nature. The Bible is very clear on that. Ephesians, put off the old man. Galatians, put off the old man, put on the new man. Be filled with the Spirit and, and other teachings like that. We understand we have that sin nature. We're not going to get rid of it till we get to heaven. But in the sight of God, we are righteous. The Bible says in Romans chapter 4 that God has imputed or placed Christ's account of righteousness on top of our account of sin. His blood is taking care of the penalty, the payment, the ledger, whatever you want to say. He's taking care of it all. He's washed it away. And so when God looks at us, he sees his child. That's what justification means. Now, are all justified? No. No. Provision's been made for it, but we have to believe in Christ to be justified. Are all reconciled? Reconciliation is two opposing parties coming back together as one agreeable unit, right? It's two people offended at each other coming to agree together being friends again. And when we fell in the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3, we became enemies of God. The Bible is very clear of that. We ceased to be his children. We became children of the devil, following after the lusts of the world. But because of Jesus, he secured reconciliation. He did the work on the cross, rose from the dead, saying, if you will believe in what I did, then you can be saved. God has already agreed. Hey, yeah, anyone that believes in Jesus can be saved. He's agreeable on one side. The rest is up to us. Will we believe? Will we come to Christ? So many won't. Some do. Praise God for each one that does. But Romans chapter 5, verse 1 through 11, which I'll let you read on your own time, talks about securing justification 
and reconciliation. We'll read a few verses. It says, therefore, being justified by faith. How are we justified with God? By faith in his son. We have peace with God. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not through our baptism, not through our prayer, not through our church membership or any man manner of things. It talks about Jesus and says, by whom also we have access, by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, patience experience, experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed because of the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. We may as well keep reading. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Who are the ungodly? All of us. Every person that's ever lived. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, the ungodly, the unlovable, but he loved us. It says in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How wonderful is that? See, the resurrection hinges on all this. If Christ is not risen, then the gospel is not good news. Because there's no proof that Christ paid our sin debt or the Father is pleased Furthermore, if Christ is not risen, then he is a liar because he prophesied that he would rise from the dead. But we understand he is risen from the dead. Let's look at number two. This may be all the further we get today. But number two, or letter B, if Christ is not risen from the dead, the preaching of the saints is in vain. The preaching of the saints is in, is in vain. Going back to 1 Corinthians 15, and reading verse 12 through 14 again. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 12. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there, if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. So many things, folks, in this world are empty, empty and pointless, aren't they? People live to forget about their lives. People live with hopes of dying, don't they? You go around on social media and whatnot, there's people that joke about suicide. People joke about saying, well, I wish I was dead. That's nothing to joke about. That's, that's sad. People live a hopeless life. They drink their cares away, don't they? They do drugs and get addicted to a great many things. Maybe they just watch TV all the time or watch movies or watch their little smartphones all the time, hoping that life will just pass them by. So many things in this world are empty and pointless. If Christ is not risen, then Bible Christianity is just one more thing to add to the list because it's just a dead religion. If Jesus is not alive, we are wasting our time here today. Seriously, aren't we? That's just reality. And so it means at least three things, just three things I want to point out. One, it means that the word of God is untrue. Everything that we do here, we seek to revolve around this book, the 66 books of the Bible. Why? Because as we talked about in Sunday school, it is the inspired, preserved word of God, and nothing else is. I mean, I've, with God's help, written some books, but those books have mistakes, and those books are just to point folks to help them study the Bible. Other people write other books. You can find mistakes in there. Back there, you know, good books to help our Bible reading, written by various individuals, some biographies, uh, and other things. And every one of them, written by a human, and they have errors in them. I'm sure well-meaning people wrote them, but we are sinners. We are not perfect. The Word of God has no error. It is all truth. It, it has to be only 
all truth. It can't be partial truth and partial not. If it's partial truth, I challenge you, because I'm not smart enough to tell what is what, I challenge you to show me what is true and what is not, and to show me your credentials that show you worthy of being such a judge, because no one is worthy. <laughs> it is all truth and can only be all truth, else we should question what we read. John 17, 17, the Lord Jesus says uh, in response to a future statement that Pilate would make, which is what is truth, which is what the Bible is saying today. And by the way, the world is right to say it, because I don't know about you, but you see all the news commentary, you see all the political commentary, you talk to a great many people, just about COVID this past year, people say, oh, masks are useless. Oh, masks are great. Oh, COVID's fake. Oh, COVID is real and it's killing everybody. Oh, this, oh, that, oh, the other. And you come out of it more confused than, as they say in the South, a termite and a yo-yo, right? If you've never heard that before, I heard that in the South. And they said it was a saying in the South, so I'm just going with that. But you say, what is real? And in respect to the world, all you can really say is, I don't know. <laughs> But you can look at God's word and say, I may not know what's going on in the world. I may not understand it all. I may not know who to trust in the government, the news media, my own family and coworkers. I may not know whose advice I can trust, but I can trust this book. And praise God for that. Because folks, if we can't, we're in a miserable way. We might as well go and follow after Dr. Phil or follow after Eastern medicine or something like that. If the Bible's not true, but it is, all in scripture is given by inspiration of God. Second Timothy 3.16 says, and again, 1 Peter 1. You see, if it's not true, Christ is a liar about a great many things. And all this that I stand up here and preach about and saying, you need to read your Bible, you need to study your Bible, you need to follow God in his word. If the Bible's not true, then I'm pointing you towards something that's untrustworthy. We waste our time studying, meditating, and applying scripture if it's not true. But if it is, think about that. Because it is. And that's why we preach. And that's why we emphasize. And that's why when people say, I don't read my Bible, big red flags go off in my mind. I'm not interested in reading my Bible, big flag, red flags go off. I don't, don't want to put my time in. I'm willing to put my time in watching movies and TV and doing all sorts of useless things, but I'm not going to read my Bible, big red flags go off. If Christ is not risen, the word of God is untrue. If Christ is not risen, number two under the topic of the preaching of the saints being vain. And preaching and teaching the word really is foolishness. <laughs> Again, what we're doing here today that the world thinks is crazy, we should just go out and enjoy ourselves. Live life for pleasure instead of being told that we're sinners, things that make us feel bad, and that we need to line up with God's word. If, if Christ is not risen, we might as well just go and be like the world and do what the world says. And uh, if you want to be religious, we might as well compromise and turn the church into a business like so many have and, and do anything possible to get people in so I can get a, a better paycheck and we can trickle it down through the congregation and we can get this building all, you know, pretty and sparkly and shiny and get the parking lot. I'm serious. If Christ is not risen, than taking the stance that we stand on according to God's word, it's pointless. 
we might as well act like the world, do the things that the world's doing. See, <laughs> right? The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Christ isn't risen. I need to read those Zig Ziglar books. Remember that? I don't know if his books are still out there. All about leadership. And there's still others out, out there. I need to read those books and how to tickle people's ears and make them feel good about themselves. And no. Christ is risen. Preaching of the cross is not foolishness. It is to the world. But it says unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. What is the gospel to you? When you hear someone give their testimony, are you like, yeah, that's, that's great. That's great. Another believer, you hear someone share what they get in their Bible reading, are you like, that's great, that's wonderful, because you love the word of God. You skip your Bible study during the week. Do you, do you feel convicted about it and say, oh, man, I, I need to catch up. I need to make sure I don't do that. If you're saved, the gospel, the preaching of the cross, the very word of God, it's the power of God. But if Christ is not risen, the gospel is just a false message. It has no power. The word of God has no power. It's as helpless as anything the world has to offer. And we're wasting our time singing praises to a dead God. It's what the world does. Why sing he lives if he's not alive? Why sing a lie if he is not risen? Why preach that you can have eternal life if you trust in Christ, if he's not alive? If Christ is not alive, everything we do is a pointless farce, fakery. And we are what the world sees us to be, fools. But he is alive. He is alive. If Christ is not risen, Preaching of the saints is in vain. And number three under that, the Great Commission is a pointless lie. What is the Great Commission? It is to preach the gospel to every creature, to baptize those that will be saved, to teach the doctrine of Christ to the same. It's the Great Commission. That's the job of every believer. It's to be a faithful witness of what God has done for them. To give the gospel, saying Jesus saves. Just one part of the Great Commission, as you probably well know, Malachi, or, yeah, Malachi Matthew 28, verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. We call that the doctrine of Christ. Jesus says, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. If Christ isn't risen, our commission is empty. You know one of the saddest things in the world is when you see things like those Mormons on their bicycles going door to door that believe that Jesus is nothing but a creation of God and the devil, his brother, and that those people go on these missions trips as part of their attempt to be saved. They don't believe in Jesus and his salvation by grace through faith. And you watch them go promoting a false Christ and you know, part of you wants to get mad at that. Another part says, oh, what, how, how sad. How sad. You see these people around the world, these Catholics getting persecuted by the Muslim and anyone that follows Catholic doctrine is not saved because they don't promote Christ. They promote the seven sacraments, they promote the Pope, they promote Mary, and they promote work salvation as we call it. And you see these people suffering for no reason. 
And you say, how sad. If they believe Catholic doctrine, they're not saved. And you know, if Christ is not risen, we would be in the same boat. We go out, we hand out tracts to people. We preach the gospel. We give out the gospel. We direct folks to the gospel, whatever we're able to do. And why? Because Christ has commanded us to do it. But if he's not alive, we're just doing it in vain. We really have no purpose if Christ is still dead. We really have no hope. But he is alive. Therefore, everything that we do, promoting a risen Savior, is giving people real hope, a real opportunity to trust in a real Christ, who can really save if people will really just believe. What we're doing here today is really not foolishness. It is surrendering to the truth of God's word, submitting ourselves unto God's words as found in scripture. Because his word is true. It is worth studying, applying, teaching, heeding. Folks, we sing that song, He Lives, I Serve a Risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I hear His voice of, see His works of mercy or something. I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. The song says, he lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me a long life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Does he live in your heart today? Have you trusted Christ as your savior? If so, praise God for it. How is your following as his disciple? Because the two go hand in hand. I'll leave you with this quote from Spurgeon. Once I find it. He says, The resurrection of our divine Lord from the dead is the cornerstone of Christian doctrine. Perhaps I might accurately call it the keystone of the arch of Christianity. For if that fact could be disproved, the whole fabric of the gospel would fall to the ground. And I add to that, the devil knows this. He will work to get our eyes off Christ, and he is very good at doing so. Do you believe in the Christ that not only died for you, but rose from the dead and offers salvation freely and forever if we will believe? And if you believe, do you follow him? And if you need help following him, that's what me and my wife are here for. That's what our church is all about. Uniting together, encouraging each other to follow Christ according to his word. Not according to what random Baptist put out there today. Or not according to my opinions and theories. But according to this book. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we have. And we pray that you would help us. If there's anyone here today that is not saved, we pray that they would humble themselves and accept Christ as their Savior. And if there's any that need to resurrender or be revived from things that have been left to fall by the wayside, we pray you would help us to follow you closer. Thank you that Jesus is alive. Thank you that what we believe is not fake. Thank you that we have a risen Savior, not a dead one. Thank you for the hope, the joy, and the peace that we have day by day that we find in Christ. Father, we pray you will work now and work in our hearts the rest of the day. Give us Give us 
what we need for the week, we pray. If you've not already, I will thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, my wife's going to come and play. I'm not going to ask anyone to raise hands or anything like that. But the question is, are you saved? Are you born again into the family of God? And if you're not, will you trust in Christ today? Will you turn to him and humble yourself and kneel, as another song says, at the cross? People say, well, I have, to, I have to get rid of this sin in my life. No, it's not about being as moral as we can be to come and see Jesus. It's bringing all that we are and saying, this is me. Take what I am. Forgive it. Cleanse it. And make me into a new person. And that's what he does. Are you saved? If you're not, will you trust in Christ today? And are you following Christ? You say, well, I stumble and I know I'm not perfect and none of us are perfect. But do you have a desire to follow Christ? And will you be willing to work on following Jesus and his word? As a Christian, as a person in this dark world that seeks to shine the light of Jesus, as a person in this world full of corruption and lies that believes the truth of God's word. What will you choose today? Let's stand together with heads bowed and eyes closed. Sarah's going to play. As she plays, do some business with the Lord, whatever God is putting on your heart, whatever decision you need to make. If you need to come have someone pray with you, we'd be happy to pray with you. But if you need help we'd be happy to help you now or after church or you can just talk to the Lord in your pew but just take this time do business with the Lord Sarah's going to play Father, we thank you for this time. We pray that you would help us for your glory. And as we leave this place, help us to not soon forget about what we've heard today, what you've spoken to us about, and your word in our hearts. Help us through the week to have the strength to walk with Christ, to live for him, and to come rejoicing Wednesday. We'll thank you for it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to 345, if you would, please.
345, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Three forty-five. Sing the first verse. Blessed assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. No one a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation. Spirit washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior. Don't know why I muted the mic, but I did. Glad you're here, and we trust that you'll have a good week. If we can be a blessing in any way, please do let us know, and we'll be praying for you. We hope to see you Wednesday at 7 o'clock. If there's any way we can help you, any way at all, please do let us know. My wife and I'd be happy to talk with you. But God bless you. Hope you have a good week. Happy.